Welcome to Data Brew by Databricks with Denny and Brooke. This series allows us to explore various topics in the data and AI community. Whether we're talking about data engineering or data science, we will interview subject matter experts to dive deeper into these topics. And while we're at it, we'll be enjoying our morning brew. My name is Denny Lee, and I'm a developer advocate at Databricks and one of the co-hosts of Data Brew. And hello, everyone. My name is Brooke Wenig, the other co-host of Databrew. I'm the machine learning practice lead at Databricks. And today I have the pleasure of introducing one of Denny and mine former colleagues, Tim Hunter, to join us today on Databrew. Uh, Tim has been working with Apache Spark since version 0.0.2, before it was an Apache project. He's also contributed and created many open source packages, including Koala, Spark SK Learn, Graph Frames, uh, TensorFlow, or sorry, Deep Learning Pipelines, and most recently, data-driven software. And I'm sure there's a few other that I've forgotten along the way. Uh, but great to have you today, Tim. Yeah, nice to see you again, Brooke. All right, so let's go ahead and kick it off with, how did you get into the field of machine learning? Let's see. So uh, I think the story starts in, for me, for in 2008. Um, I was doing a master's at uh, Stanford. And there was this class, CS229, which now actually is the basis for all the, the MOOCs in the machine learning. And the, so, so the advisor who was teaching this class was Andrew Ang. And back then, there was no uh, deep learning. They were, people were barely starting to talk about GPUs. And I would say that the, the king of the day that everybody was talking about for doing recognition was things like uh, SIFT, like, so very like handcrafted, all these handcrafted features for doing machine learning. And Andrew started his class with uh, explaining all the possibilities that you could do with AI. And he started with um, his video of his helicopter project, which was doing incredible aerobatics, purely remote controlled by, uh, by a computer. And well, I think when I saw that, I thought, this is it. This is going to be the future of uh, autonomous vehicles. This is going to be the future of everything that we see like moving around. And I think this is really what drove me to, to get started. And this is how I got, uh, and after that, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to actually work on this helicopter project uh, under the supervision of Andrew Ang and, uh, and a few of his students. So I think, yeah, this is really where it got started. So I know after your master's, you followed up with a PhD at Berkeley, um, and then you've been working in industry since then. What excites you most about the field of machine learning that keeps you staying in this field? I think, so to me, this is the, the I would say, infinite possibilities. Um, you, you know that with machine learning, you can apply it to everything, every topic that you can think about. You can always think about the way that ML or AI can be plugged into it to improve this field and to improve the knowledge of it. And these days, what really excites me is that there is also a feedback loop. It's not just ML being applied to solve a problem, but often ML can also bring some new insights about how this, um, how this problem is being solved. And for example, these days, if you want to do some complex um, physics simulations, it turns out that ML is a pretty good solution, even sometimes beating the state of the art that has been handcrafted by people doing some physics-based modeling. So it really tells us that when you use data, it captures some insight that we as, as uh, researchers have not necessarily thought about into how the world works. And that ML essentially exposes that in a way that then we need to also understand ourselves. And having this, I would say, conversation with uh, ML, seeing what it gives us as new insights, not only when it predicts something, but how it does it, this is something that I find really, really exciting because I'm, I'm very curious and I love to see how not only we understand the world through equations, but also how crunching the data that comes out of it, we can also discover some new insight about the world. Yeah, that's really cool, Tim. Uh, so, I mean, let's roll back into how you've already taken that desire to understand the world with ML to all the packages you've created, right? So you've created, just like Brooke was calling out in the beginning, open source packages from SKLearn, to, uh, Spark SKLearn to Koalas. But then most recently, you've developed one called Data Driven Software. So can you share what that project is and what is it currently trying to solve that's not being solved? I'm curious. Yeah, so when you look into the, the whole ecosystem for doing data processing, one problem that I see coming over and over again is how, when you process your data, how you want to link and chain all these pieces in a way 
that is fast and coherent. So for example, when you download some data from the internet, then usually you're not going to just stop at downloading it. You after that are going to process it and build a whole pipeline on top of that. For example, you're going to combine it with other data sources. You are going to, to run a machine learning model that you will apply to it. And whenever one of your data sources change or whenever you change your code, you need to be able to rerun everything that depends out of that. So DDS, uh, this package, with, is helping the, the developers for, who write their code in Python by capturing in a smart way all the dependencies that you have on your code when you write a model. So let's say that you decide to change a hyperparameter into your model. It will know which piece of all your pipeline to rerun and which results to regenerate at the end. So you never have to think about, am I using the latest version? Do I need to rerun this notebook? Because if it needs to be rerun, it will run it for you. So that's really cool. So then let's let's go into the, so almost the philosophy around data-driven software, right? In, in, it seems like in our current software engineering practi practices, are you observing that we as a community or as an industry, we're sort of focusing on the steps, like each single step in the process in terms of processing versus actually programming statements to describe the data to be matched and the processing required. In other words, we're focusing more on the steps themselves versus understanding and making sense of the data. Yeah, th yeah this is a very good question. I think that when you look into how we do software right now, we are just really, and especially software around the field of AI and, and data science, we're really at the beginning of, of the journey. We're barely understanding how to combine code and how to process data in general. And you know, this is not, this is not something that, um, that, that come from me. A lot of people much more senior than I am have been saying that about the field. Um, Andre Caparty from Tesla has been talking about rebuilding a whole software 2.0 stack that would be able to incorporate machine learning models inside regular software. And the question I've, I often ask myself is how, do we can, how can we get started? Where do we go? And one problem that uh, I see often is that we, we data, science, uh, data scientists and ML researchers, we spend a lot of time reading and writing pieces when we write code. So this sounds like very, very, very much of a, of a uh, really a two different paradigms trying to be combined together. Why do we need to think about where things should be stored? We don't do that when we think about computer code. So the first step that I can think about helping to go into this journey is how can we think in a coherent fashion between all the data pieces that we extract, statistics, ML models, larger data set, and how we combine that with code that, do, that does all the transformation. So I love that data is the artifact with data-driven software. Can you talk about how you get some of the scalability behind this? Like, what are you doing to cache certain steps so you don't have to recompute these computations? How are you actually storing the data that you're keeping as an artifact? Yeah, so the, the key idea of data-driven software is that whenever you write some code, the output of the code should be always the same when you rerun it and when the code has not changed. If your code changes, then it's going to create a different output. And in that sense, it solved the problem of thinking about where the data is coming from and how, should it, how fresh it, it should be. Because the data can either be raw, so the original data set that you acquired from somewhere, or it can be the result of a transformation. And when you think about it this way, it means that you just need to think about the software that created uh, your, um, your data. You just need to think about the codes that generated all this data set. And this removes all the questions you may have about, is this data going to, is this data stored? Is it the right version? Or is it, uh, or should it be stored in a different system? And then it is not going to be up to sync with something else. Then you just need to think about your code and you don't have any of the question that you, that you would have in, um, in a, for example, in data warehouse system where you need to think whether you plug the right version with each other and whether you need to rerun your, your data pipeline. So essentially it is saying solving problems at the data level, this is too hard. It is too big. Why don't we solve it at the code level? When and whenever you change your code, this is when you know that you should change your data that uh, goes along with the code. You can think of the data as being just a piece that goes along with the code. 
and to accelerate some of the calculations. Yeah, I can't tell you the number of times where I've seen data scientists think, oh, just this one small tweak to the feature engineering won't impact anything. Let me just check it in without rerunning everything. And boom, everything exploded. It was like they change imputation from mean to median or something that they think is pretty harmless. Or even worse is somebody thinks they're just adding a comment, but oops, that keystroke slipped. Um, so I definitely see a need for data-driven software for data scientists to be able to understand the dependencies um, of each of the steps in their machine learning pipelines. But I just want to hear from you. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see people face when they're trying to design these large scale machine learning pipelines? Like if I'm building a simple scikit-learn model of like one hot encoded linear regression, maybe I don't need data-driven software. But if I'm building much larger, much more complex pipelines, I definitely need it. And I just want to see what are some of the challenges you see people typically facing with these real world machine learning pipelines? So one of the main challenges I see uh, in, in the, the world of data science in a large company, right now I work at a fairly large company with, um, with tens of thousands of employees. And I would say the data science for, uh, workforce is about a thousand people. And in such a complex environment, especially when the, com the company like mine has been around for more than 200 years, you can imagine that you have a lot of diversity of ideas and code structures and essentially silos of uh, various, uh, of various um, data, prov data uh, providers. And because of that, when you want to do a model which is of any complexity, you need to rely already on dozens of subsystems that would need to be already sync to give you the uh, data that you can assume is of high enough quality. For example, in this case, so since uh, I'm working at a bank, if you have data set coming from transactions and you want to link it with customers, you need already to be able to say that the customers you are going to see are the ones that correspond to these transactions, not the customers from a month ago, and then miss a few in the process and have all these sort of data alignment problems that tend to, be, then tend to be pretty typical. So being able to break down these barriers between all the silos, not only at the level of the, the process, but also at the level of the engineering, is something that is still, I would say, a very, very hard challenge for large companies. And this is why you see now more and more, and more this concept of feature store coming in, which essentially boils down to the idea that you can build a set of features, so a set of uh, attributes for, for various uh, data points that you have. And underneath, what this really corresponds to is building a data warehouse with some pipelines to be able to automate the chaining of the dependencies between all these features. Now, do we need to have a completely separate system for doing that? I think that this problem is more general than that. And I don't think we need to focus just on the idea of building features for machine learning for the simple reason that when you build features, they're going to be input into a model. And this model is typically going to be used to transform other data set that you want to input themselves as features. So there is already all these loops and these dependencies. And how to capture these dependencies between teams and between processes is really, a, is really why I see a lot of um, groups struggling. Got it. And I know you're using data-driven software at Avian uh, Amro. Can you talk a little bit more about the branching capabilities of it and how this is allowing data scientists to experiment but without reinventing the wheel and ensuring any code that they write can be checked in safely? Yeah, so the, the way we use it is thanks to the capability I mentioned that we can treat with it, we can treat uh, data as if it was code. And in particular, that means you can, you can start from a code base that generates some data sets, and then you can fork this code base, change, for example, a mean into a median, change some hyperparameters. This will create other data sets and other views of the same data set. And because this is all in its own namespace, like, uh, like in, in software, if you run it, you're not going to have an impact on what is happening in the main branch because it is your code, it is going to be your data. And when you merge again, this branch into the, into the for example, let's say the, the production branch, then your code has already been written and because it has already been um, executed. You have already calculated all the statistics that correspond to this branch. So when you merge it back into the production branch, the stable branch, 
then you have already calculated everything that was on your branch. This is going to be the same results into the, in, into, the, into the stable branch. So everybody will already be able to reuse all the work that you have done pre-calculating all these elements because the code that you are going to, to merge is going to be the same as the one that you, that, that you just um, executed. So because of that, that means that with uh, a system like uh, data-driven software, you do not need to think about how far you are deviating from what everybody else is doing. You can simply fork your code, make all the changes you want, and when you merge them back, people will have the confidence that whatever you have been working on, it is ready, it is going to be correct because it is going to evaluate all the dependencies it has. And when you merge it back, then this is going to propagate instantly all the data that you have created, all the new artifacts that you have created to everybody else who sees this new code. So this is why with a system like DDS, you can really think as data as being simply an add-on to the code that you're writing. Just like in Git, you track the history into a repository. This is the same concept. You assign signatures and unique signatures for every piece of data that you create. And as you merge branch fork, this, the code is going to be the reference and then the data will, um, will, will automatically be attached to, to all these pieces. Okay, that sounds pretty cool. But then I'm going to naturally, be, you know, coming from my background, switch back to big data, which is, well, wasn't, isn't there a massively large impact here, right? Like, as in, you've got all of this code. Sure, you've got all these artifacts, but considering we're working with terabytes to petabytes worth of data, wouldn't that, like, what's the impact here? I'm just curious then. Yes, so this comes with the, so the current version, in that sense, comes with a very naive assumption, which is, whenever you create a new data set, for example, you know, you take your petabyte size of DNA in, um, in your store, you decide to do some filtering. If you change one variable, it is simply going to see a new data set, which is potentially pretty much the same as what was before, but it will have no notion of how much changes there was compared to other versions. It is not checking whether you made you make differences it is every data set as a new data set so the impact is that it may end up rewriting a lot of new tables if you make a change it might decide to say we're going to reprocess this petabyte and we're going to simply allocate a new petabyte in your data store for doing that and this is why it comes with a, a graphical feature that allows you to see if you make a change before it runs, it allows you to see the graph of all the dependencies and all the data set that will need to be regenerated. So before you run it, it will already be able to tell you how much, pretty much how much data you're going to, to process and write down after that. Typically, I would say it is not so much of a problem because just like in a software problem, if you modify a very fundamental component at the bottom, that is going to have an impact on everything. For example, you modify the way the, something talks to the database, then it's going to impact all your modules all over the place because everybody wants to talk to a database. This is the same problem. There's nothing new here. The software engineers have the same problem of when they make changes that fundamentally re-architect everything, they will, need to, um, they will need to think how to actually make some, some other path, such as creating an alternative version of it, then migrating everybody onto it and so on. And with a system like DDS, you can very simply do that in the sense that you can create a new alternative data set and then you can get people slowly migrating to this new one while keeping the other one existing. And then when, when the old one, the very large old one is also not being used and not a dependency for everybody else, you can safely remove it and everybody will have migrated to the new one. So that's how you can, just like in the software world, you can do migration of this data set. No, that actually makes a ton of sense. Actually, I'm going to pull back one of your call outs about data warehousing because this is what, you're, what you're talking about here is actually very similar to how we would typically migrate a data warehouse anyways, except that from the perspective of DDS, it seems like from an operational perspective, it's 
well designed for this purpose as opposed to in the traditional data warehousing world it re usually required months upon months and often didn't work anyways because of all the, the the fact that we never actually understood what all of our dependencies were so then this actually naturally segues to my next question which is then well then how does like a lake house architecture fit into all this because it seems like you you want some of that like almost like warehousing capability but considering the vast amount of data that you're talking about, that's like back to good old fashioned data lake. So I'm just wanted your perspective on this. Yeah, so where the lake house really comes with very interesting capabilities is that, especially when you're talking about you know, petabyte size of data, if someone is in the process of writing them, it is not instant. So you still need to be able to have, to have some consistency for everybody while all these data sets are being, are being written, especially if multiple people are trying to do the same change. And then you need to be able to tell them, hold on, you are already writing and making this change here. You here, you can wait for this other, this other process to finish. And then you can simply read it instead of trying to redo the same calculation. So the a system like a lake house allows you to have a much more atomic view of the changes and to have a globally consistent view of every of for everybody, and with a system like um, on, so, when it is coupled with a system like DDS, where essentially what you do is doing some commits of changes of work. This is really what a data lake house offers on top of a regular warehouse, and this prevents anybody from suffering from corruption because of data in flight. So that makes a big uh, that, that makes a really big difference. No, that makes a ton of sense, Tim. So then what naturally is happening here is then is that because you've got all this data in flight and it's, does that now also imply that you're basically storing all of the data all the time? Or is it more likely in reality, you're actually just taking, uh, uh, migrating people, uh, sorry, trying different experiments with your data, just like with your machine learning seeing if they work and then only keeping the artifacts that are necessary. I'm, I'm just curious, like, like what would the productionization flow look like for this, something like this? Yeah, so I think it, it goes a bit to the, to the natural tension there is already in the software world between your notebook and your IDE where you write some code. In a notebook is a great place for experimenting, trying a lot of parameters and everything, but usually you don't want to keep all the, all the experiment that you want to do. This is more a big scratch pad where you can experiment a lot. And you are usually alone in trying, in doing all these experiments. You are making multiple runs, you are making, uh, you're, you're retrying with different parameters and so on. Then next to you, next to that, you have the paradigm, I would say closer to the ML engineer or the software engineer, which is all the work that you do on code, which is also versioned, which is usually reviewed, and which is merged into a much larger system where you have more guarantees of stability. And DDS is meant to help you on this part mostly, while making sure that every piece that you depend on when you run inside your notebook, you can assume that it is going to be the latest, the most consistent, the, the consistent part and that you're not going to use some stale version of, of, uh, of your data. So in that sense, it is helping you ease, and it is going to help you to ease your, your mind into the comfort that this is going to be the latest version of the data and of the code at the same time. You do not need to have to think, do I have the latest library to access my, um, my data set? I also know with that that I'm also accessing the latest version of the data set itself. No need to think about two, these two as being different. After that, you can use a system like you know, MLflow, for example, to experiment, find the most optimal set of hyperparameters for what you are doing. And once, but once you want to go to production, usually you do not want to rerun all the experiments. You just want to have one, one set of a model and you want to plug this model into the rest of your system. And this is where DDS can come back when you can tell it, where you tell it what, uh, what your model is going to be, and then you put it inside the pipeline. Everybody depends on that. The changes can propagate, and you can consider this experiment as being done for the moment. So then I guess the, 
with the productionization of your DDS pipelines, and I'm curious, do you think there's, you've already mentioned like the potential integration with MLflow, which makes a ton of sense. I'm also curious from the potential integration with Delta, for example, like from the standpoint of whether it's your debugging of your data or time travel or schema evolution. I'm just curious from that standpoint, where does that fit in uh, from the standpoint of productionizing your workflows with DDS? Yeah, so this is, I would say, a complementary approach to it. Um, because as we discussed before, DDS has no notion of what is a derivative data set from another. Whenever you make a change, it is going to be a completely, from its perspective, it is going to be completely new. Now, if you're using a pipeline, like a Spark pipeline on Delta, for example, then there are a lot of very smart things you can do to not have to rewrite the whole data set. This part, I would say, is much more of a, of a work in progress. And... I would say much more so of a research, uh, research topic because being able to take a, a pipeline and being able to find the derivative of another pipeline and exactly what needs to be changed between two, two versions of it, it is, it is not trivial. You can approach it mostly at, at the commit level. When time comes to actually write the data, then you can say, okay, this, this new table, like this new table had the same columns plus a few others and then you try to see which one actually need to be written. Or you can approach it at a much higher level directly at the plan itself and then see what really are the differences when you're going to write, what you really need to add. And I want to say that the, for this topic, the jury is still a bit out into which one works the best. And I think there are different trade-offs depending on the circumstances. I would say that in, in general, when you work in, a, in an enterprise, you tend to have not so many large, very large tables. You tend to start with a few extremely large tables, and then you have a lot of refined version of it, which tend to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you go into the smaller views of, this, uh, of your original data set, then it's usually not very big. Usually it can be into the gigabytes, into the hundreds of megabytes, like even, even if we go up to 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, it's usually cheap enough to simply regenerate everything all the time, given the, given, given the other constraint that you have about being correct, being reliable, and building also a whole pipeline around it. So I would say that these two usages are complementary in that respect. Well, all of this is super fascinating and interesting. One thing that I'm really impressed by, Tim, is your strong background in, engineer, in data engineering and big data. And I'm curious, what skills would you recommend data scientists to pick up so they can go off and be able to develop their own packages like this or think at scale about how do they productionize their machine learning pipelines? So yeah, this is, this is a very broad question, Brooke. So let me see how I, can, uh, how, how I can address that. I would say that the, even for the most hardcore data scientists, I would say like, if, about 80% of your time will be spent on processing data, not on writing models, not on finding the best hyperparameters, not even on having the, inventing some new ways of, um, of doing, some machine uh, doing some cool machine learning. It is going to be simply, how do I take my data and how do I put it inside this form here? How do I take my wrong data, make it fit into the square data, um, the, the square peg of, uh, of a data pipeline? And I need to plug, I need to, be, to make a plug between the two. And this is where I think that a lot of the basic skills for software engineer um, can really help. And especially when it teaches you how to be simple in that respect, which is using simple data structures, using basic functions, using some static code analysis, all the tools that, uh, you know, check your code, check that you are not reusing some variables, and especially teaches you not to use fancy features in your favorite programming languages. Like, in, for example, in Python or Scala, you have, you know, properties, decorators, you have five ways to mix it, to do mixing and traits and all of that. It is very tempting to use it, but in practice, it just makes, uh, it just make, uh, makes your, your life, I would say, as a data scientist, much harder after that when times come to understand what, uh, what you have been doing. That, I would say, the, the direct, direct skill. Um, another one that, is I think really helpful for um, for data scientists uh, to 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 pick up from um, from software engineers is that the software engineers always have to think about trade-offs. You know, 
Am I spending more time on making something correct? Am I spending more time on making it faster? Or am I spending more time on inventing new ideas? It is always going to be a trade-off between these three points. And software engineers are trained by default to be given impossible tasks to accomplish immediately and to do, that, to do that perfectly. Data scientists, I would say sometimes, can, um, can, can have also, can, can learn from that to, to see how they can trade off all the different aspects and that is going to make them, I think, very effective after that in the, in the long run. That's some excellent advice, especially keeping things simple. I think that's one of the areas where data scientists really struggle is they want to build these complex, fancy models. They want to be using the latest TensorFlow add-on feature, but simple can actually be better. And so I think that's really good advice that you provided. And so I just wanted to finish off today by saying thank you so much for joining us on Data Brew, Tim. I always learn a lot from uh, these discussions with you, especially about treating data as an artifact. And if there's one thing I want everybody in the audience to take away from the session, is treat data the same way you treat your code. If you don't version your code, you're not gonna version your data. But if you version your code, you should definitely start versioning your data so you don't re reinvent the wheel. So once again, thank you again for joining us today on Data Brew, Tim. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Denny. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.